Hi, everyone. My name is John Quackenbush, and I'm really happy to have the opportunity to tell you about some of the work that I and my group are doing to look at the problem of health disparities, in particular, um, the problem that we face in understanding differences in disease between males and females. And I want to tell you a little bit about how we're using networks to understand um, those differences in risk and to really understand cancer risk and cancer therapies. So the starting point for a lot of this is really the availability of the human genome sequence. And as most of you know, the genome was sequenced and published uh, as a draft 20 years ago. But that genome, while it gave us a catalog of all 25,000 genes, really didn't solve the problem of letting us understand how the genetic uh, program encapsulated in those genes or encoded in those genes plays itself out in all the different cell types that exist in our bodies. More importantly, it didn't really provide a complete understanding of how that genetic uh, program plays itself out differently in health and disease. So that's the challenge that I and my colleagues have been wrestling with for some time, dealing with this kind of biological complexity. And our answer to this problem of understanding how the genome and the genes it encodes really allow us to understand the broad um, scope of phenotypes that we see is that networks of interacting elements in the cell actually mediate the translation between the genetic code and the phenotypes that we observe. So my colleagues and I have been building a whole host of different tools for inferring and understanding gene regulatory networks. And we tend to name them after animals. And because of that, the collection of tools which we've assembled over the last few years are included in a package that we call NetZoo or the Network Zoo. And this is an integrated set of tools in R, Python, MATLAB, and C, with most tools implemented in all languages that allow us to look at gene regulatory networks, to model them, and to start to compare them between different phenotypic groups to really get a better understanding of these intricate biological processes that are taking place. So I'm gonna look at those tools in the context of asking a variety of questions. And the first is, can we simply model the gene regulatory process? One of the fundamental things that allowed me to really start thinking about this problem um, in a very nuanced way was a paper that one of my students, Amira Jabari, showed me now almost 20 years ago. And this was a paper by Wolverton McCready, uh, who were two computer scientists working at Microsoft on the problem of optimization. And in looking at this problem, what they recognized was that many people were using sort of black box algorithms to try to solve these uh, optimization problems, but that there was no way to really use these to get general purpose solutions that work in all possible situations. And the last highlighted sentence here was one that was really key for me. These same results also indicate the importance of incorporating problem-specific knowledge into the behavior of the algorithm. What that says is that if you want to solve a very difficult, nearly intractable computational problem, the best way to start is by incorporating what you know about the system and making an educated guess as to how the solution should work. And that's really been the fundamental tool, um, the fundamental idea that underlies our development of a lot of these different methods. So the very first method and very first animal in our zoo that we developed was a method that we call Panda. And this was work that I do with uh, Kimberly Glass, who's one of my close colleagues and collaborators, Curtis Huttenhauer, GC Yuan, and it was really based on our understanding of how regulation occurs in the cell. That if we're going to make an RNA, right, and that's really the output of this gene regulatory process, if we're going to make an RNA, the, the synthesis of that RNA is really enabled by the binding of proteins called transcription factors to regions around that gene that either activate or potentially repress um, the regulatory process. And so the starting point for our modeling is really recognizing that transcription factors are sending messages um, that are turned into RNA through this transcriptional regulatory process. But regulation is very complex. So how do we sort out all the different potential factors that are acting? Well, one of the things we recognize is that if two genes are regulated by the same transcription factor, they're likely to be co-expressed. 
In the same way, we, re we recognize that transcription factors often form complexes. And if they do, protein-protein interaction data that suggests transcription factors can bind together can provide some evidence for co-regulation. So the way we really implement this method is to recognize that we have multiple sources of data and information, that what we can do if we want to infer a regulatory network that models the way in which transcription factors activate or repress genes is to start with a guess as to what that network looks like. So to scan the genome, to look for transcription factor motifs, and to postulate what that network might look like. But then, as I mentioned earlier, we do have other sources of data and information like protein-protein interaction data between transcription factors, co-regulation data between genes and a particular phenotype. And so what we can do is estimate functions that show either how um, available the genes are or how active or responsible the transcription factors are in carrying out this regulatory process. And then we look for consistency among these data sets, we update our network model, and then we iterate the process until we converge on a final network. Once we have that, what we do is we look at the data we have available, and much of that data is data that comes from experiments like gene expression experiments. We can always do things like look for differentially expressed genes, but what we try to do is for each phenotype, infer a network and then combine the data and information we have to look at the structure and topology of the network, how that structure and topology changes between phenotypes, and then integrating those changes with information about the genes, including expression and other data, to really arrive at an understanding of what's driving the individual phenotypes we're trying to study. In addition, what we've started to recognize over time is that we can take the individual samples and for each sample in the population, we can infer and network for that individual. And we can start to look at differences between individual networks and think of those networks and the structures as really being complex biomarkers that allow us to understand how differences in regulatory processes are predictive of biological state or things like response to therapy. So this has been the fundamental paradigm that we've used. To get to that state, though, of looking at individual sample networks, what we have to think about doing is really looking at how we move from an aggregate network for each uh, phenotypic group that we study to really understanding how we tease out individual networks. And the way we do that is actually to use a simple linear interpolation method that allows us to infer from that one network networks for each individual in the population we want to study. So the idea is very simple, that what we can do is we can look at a single sample network uh, by starting off inferring the network for the entire population, but then leaving out an individual sample and asking what is the effect of leaving out that network in inferring, uh, leaving out that sample and in inferring the network. And it won't surprise you that by leaving out a sample, we can actually subtly change some of the connections in the network, such that if I look at the differences between them, I can see the, the effect of leaving out that particular sample. And if you think about it just a little bit, it's pretty easy to convince yourself that if you scale those differences by the number of samples in the network and add it back to the network without the, the sample that's been left out, you can actually estimate that individual sample network. So it's very easy to write this out. It's very easy to solve this problem edge by edge in the network and arrive at an underlying network model. So this is something we've also published. This is called Lioness. And um, the, Lioness, the Lioness method has been used in a wide variety of different problems. Some of those we've looked at are looking at uh, tissue-specific regulation in 38 different tissues using data from GTEx. And then in 29 of those tissues where we had male and female samples addressing this understudied problem of what the differences are between the sexes in terms of the processes that drive phenotype. So with these two questions answered, the third question we wanted to sort of address is, do networks actually matter? Do they give us something beyond what we can look at or what we can understand by simply exploring differential expression? So earlier this year, um, Debbie Weghill, I, and some others took a look at this in a very focused way because we understand um, the importance of networks, but many people have asked us to really provide some level of support. 
And we started by looking at the very simple question of what we see in networks. And part of what we see is co-expression. We see groups of genes activated together that carry out particular processes. So we asked, can you just look at a simple toy model? In this case, we have four genes and nine individuals where the patterns of gene expression change. And we also looked at patterns that change where some genes are correlated and some are not. And what we were able to show in this little toy model was that you can see differences not only in expression, but actually in patterns of co-expression that may provide some insight into what is occurring in the system beyond looking at individual genes. Because if a group of genes are being activated or repressed together, you can start to imagine that the processes that they're involved with are somehow involved in this phenotype beyond what we'd see by looking at the individual genes themselves. So the real question was, could we apply this idea to looking more broadly, not only at co-expression, but at gene regulatory networks? So what Debbie decided to do was to look at TCGA data for pancreatic cancer and to use these network methods to compare two different subtypes in pancreatic cancer, looking not only at gene expression and co-expression, but then also looking at whether or not particular genes in our gene regulatory network models using Panda and Linus are targeted in different ways. And what's really exciting about this analysis is that what Debbie was able to show, oops, what Debbie was able to show was that when we look at these individual networks, there are things that are specific shown here in the middle in blue to looking at gene expression, but not necessarily that informative. There are things that we can see using co-expression that are also um, seen in looking at the regulatory network models, but that the regulatory network models actually identify different processes that are targeted specifically in, in different subtypes of pancreatic cancer that include things like immune-related processes, epigenetic processes, and cell cycle processes that we couldn't see looking at this data from any other vantage point. So these regulatory networks beyond co-expression networks, beyond co-expression by itself, beyond expression by itself, really give us unique insight into processes which are important for understanding disease. So the question is, how do we apply that? And how do we look at this question that I opened with? Um, the question of understanding how males and females differ in cancer risk and cancer response. So we've looked at this problem uh, looking at colon cancer. And this is a really nice example because one of the things that we understand is that male and female cancers are in fact different in their risks and outcomes. So in 2016, there's a nice review published in Nature Reviews Cancer that looked at males, that looked at males and females, um, looking at both cancer incidence and cancer mortality, showing dramatic differences in a number of different cancers. And what this article really points out is that men and women have a different natural history um, in developing diseases like cancer, have different response to therapy and in fact, often manifest disease in ways that are different and unique to those individuals. So what we decided to do was to look at colon cancer, colorectal cancer, and to use data from TCGA to begin to explore these differences, to look at the regulatory processes that are different, and then to ask, can we actually replicate these findings in other studies? So this is the basic outline of the study that we proposed or that we undertook. We took data from either TCGA uh, or GEO, we did batch correction, we did normalization, and then we looked, since we're looking at males and females, at just how many individual samples we could accurately annotate as being male or female samples. Um, we ended up with 445 in our discovery set and almost 1,200 in our validation set both almost evenly divided between males and females. I mentioned that one of the things we did was that we looked at the sex, um, or we looked to try to check the sex of the individuals. And this is something that we've discovered over time in looking at sex differences is actually very important because one of the fundamental um, assumptions that we make is that females, 
are not do, not going to express Y chromosome genes and that males should. Most of these studies don't look at gender, they look at sex. So the biological sex um, of the patients we're looking at should really discriminate between those who have X chromosomes or Y chromosomes and those who don't. And what's shown here are the samples that are annotated as female in red, and you can see the samples that are annotated male in blue. And there are a few males who are scattered among that small clump of females on the left, and a few females who are scattered through the group of males on the right that suggest that these indiv individuals may have been somehow misassigned sex or that their data may somehow have been scrambled. There are some studies where we see low incidence of this, there are other studies where we see as many as 20% of the samples that seem to be misidentified by sex, causing us to question many of the other annotations in those data sets. Nevertheless, this is an important part of our quality control, particularly if we're looking at the importance of sex in moderating health and disease. So one of the things we started with was this basic assumption that males and females are going to be expressing genes differently. And um, all of this data was performed using surgical samples uh, at, at the time of surgery before chemotherapy and uh, or any adjuvant treatment. And what we did was we looked at differential expression as our first baseline measure. Probably not surprising uh, to most of you is that when we found differential expression, essentially all that differential expression we found that was significant to any measure whatsoever were on genes that were located on the X and Y chromosome. And probably not surprisingly, none of these genes actually explain anything about the observed clinical differences we see in males and females who have colon cancer. So we asked ourselves, how can we go beyond this? How can we look at networks to understand this? So we followed a very simple protocol. We downloaded the data, we inferred gene regulatory networks for males and females, and then we looked at differential targeting. Essentially, we looked at the number of edges that are regulating each gene in these regulatory models and added up their weights. Then we did a simple statistical test for the uh, collection of networks for males comparing to the collection of networks for females and asked, are there differences in the relative edge weights or the differential targeting Right, the, the sum of the edge weights and the differential targeting of particular genes uh, in males and females. And we did this correcting for stage, age, race, and other covariates. And then once we found those differentially regulated genes, we asked, what do those genes do and what does it tell us about disease? So not surprisingly, we found one gene that seemed to be differentially targeted on the X chromosome but many other genes on the autosome that were either upregulated in males or, sorry, um, increased in their targeting in males or up-targeted in females. And when we looked at those, what we saw, unlike looking at the differential expression data, was that there were many genes involved in processes that we could link back to specific differences in disease development, progression, and most important, in response to therapy. Because one of the things we know is that males and females respond differently to chemotherapy. In looking at this differential targeting analysis, what we found was the genes in the drug metabolism pathway were far more strongly targeted in females than males. And what this suggested to us is that males and females are likely to respond differently to chemotherapy, something we know happens clinically. Now, this was a really rewarding finding for us because these samples were taken before any chemotherapy uh, was given to these patients, right? These are surgical samples at the time of surgery before treatment with chemotherapy. And so even though we know the clinical endpoint or the clinical outcome is that males and females respond differently to chemotherapy, this model, this regulatory interaction or regulatory network modeling, tells us that that's something that we should suspect. And more than that, actually tells us what genes are likely to be involved in the differential response that we see. So we looked beyond our discovery cohort to our validation cohort, and what we found was that in that validation cohort, males and females responded differently to chemotherapy. 
just as we would have predicted, and that the genes that are activated in males and females that are differentially targeted in men and women are actually um, uh, overlapping to a very large extent. And so what we were able to do is really validate the findings that suggest that regulation of genes in men and women is a big part of what distinguishes outcomes in response to therapy. So then the question is, if we look at men and women and we look at the regulatory networks, what does this tell us about the ultimate response of these individuals to treatment? And what was particularly exciting in looking at these data is that when we took a step back and asked among those individuals who had very high targeting um, and very low targeting of the drug metabolism pathway, are there differences in outcomes? And what we found that was most interesting was that among the males, there was very little difference in targeting and in fact, very little difference in outcome. Well, if we looked at the females, those that had more female characteristic targeting uh, profiles behaved or had much better outcome than those who had more male-like targeting profiles. That in fact, the, the targeting, uh, the low targeting group of females, as we might have predicted, respond uh, and have outcome profiles that are much more like those of their male counterparts in the same studies. So what this really suggests is that there are regulatory processes that are active in females that if they are increased in their activity, actually have long-term survival benefits in terms of response to chemotherapy and outcome. It also suggests that by starting to dive in and understand what those regulatory differences are, we might begin, begin to think about ways in which we can treat male and female cancers differently. Or we might be able to think about ways in which we can treat subgroups of individuals differently to change their response profiles by moderating or modifying the way in which these regulatory processes are active in their individual disease states. So one of the other questions we can start to ask since males and females respond differently is whether or not males and females actually have different genetic risks. And I don't have time to talk about this in great detail today, but one of the other questions we explored was looking not at transcription factors, but at EQTL data, looking at the interaction between SNPs and genes. And what we found was that in looking at EQTL networks, cancer risk SNPs actually are associated with the regulation of oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. So that SNPs found through GWAS studies are actually those that regulate um, or are associated with differential regulation of oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, as well as other genes that are involved in cancer-related processes. So we started to ask ourselves, well, can we take that in data and information and combine it with the kind of ideas that I talked about with lioness inferring individual sample networks and comparing them between men and women? And recently, we, we developed a new method called EGRIT that looks at the association between SNPs that occur in the genome that are in EQTLs with genes that we want to understand, genes for which we want to understand the regulatory processes to infer individual specific genotype specific regulatory models. And so this paper describing this analysis is available on BioArchive. I don't have time to take you through it. It's about, I hope, to be accepted in a journal and should be published soon. We sent in second revisions, but I'm always hesitant to mention journals until we actually get um, the certified acceptance. But the paper's been up on BioArchive. There's code to execute this in the network zoo. And I invite you to take a look at it because it's really exciting. What it suggests is these regulatory SNPs combined with differences in regulatory processes between males and females may really help us to understand how disease risk itself is moderated in the two different sexes individually. So the last question I want to ask is, what does this all tell us about drugs and drug response? 
And again, I don't have time to go into great detail here, but I want to bring to your attention another resource that I and my colleagues have developed. Um, and this is largely work done by Mero and Ben Gabilla uh, to build a database and data resource that we call GRAND. GRAND is a gene regulatory network database. Uh, the URL is down at the bottom. And what Marowen did in assembling GRAND was first address the question that we were wrestling with, or a problem that we were wrestling with. And that was the problem of not having a database in which, in which we could store these regulatory models that we were building. And so Marowen set out to, uh, to amalgamate these uh, and consolidate them in a single searchable reference resource. In doing that, he ended up running a lot of other network inference models on a problem that he was interested in, namely response to drugs and response to therapeutics. And he ended up building a resource that in some ways is like the connectivity map, but instead of looking at differences in gene expression uh, and changes in gene expression, to predict potential drug uh, candidates. What Marowen did is really looked at the kind of things that I and my group have been looking at for a long time, these differences in network structures. So built into GRAND is actually a tool that we call ClueReg. And what ClueReg does is it looks at networks that were derived tracell lines that were treated with drugs both before and after treatment to see changes in the regulatory regulatory processes. Then what one can do is look at your own individual network models that you've inferred using tools like Panda and Linus. And you can take those network models and simply ask what drugs might actually do the sorts of things I was talking about earlier. What drugs might actually take a regulatory network model and change them in ways that will provide insight into how to better treat disease to get the, the responses that we're looking for and anticipate. So one of the examples I just wanna show here in brief is a comparison between uh, differential colon cancer networks looking at the high targeting and low targeting nodes, the same kind of differences we've seen between men and women. And in looking at these differences, one of the things that ClueReg found was an experimental drug called MK5109 that's a candidate therapy for colon cancer. And in fact, this is a drug that's shown um, activity in non-small cell lung carcinoma, another disease in which there is uh, a strong difference between men and women in overall disease development and response to therapy. So, what we're starting to see is a really exciting picture that emerges from looking at gene regulatory networks. What these networks allow us to do is to really get at changes that we can't see in other ways. Changes in regulatory processes that help explain disease. Changes in regulatory processes that help explain one of the most underexplored questions in modern biology. Why are men and women different in the way they develop disease and respond to therapy? And more importantly, if we see these differences, how can we begin to identify drugs that may be more efficacious in treating one subgroup or another, whether they be males and females or good responders and, and poor responders based on the regulatory processes, the processes that fundamentally control gene expression? So why do we bother with, net, with networks? Well, in numerous applications, we found that networks provide insight into disease that is not found using expression or co-expression. Differential targeting captures not only a phenotype's current expression, but also its potential to respond. Remember, in this colon cancer example, we're looking at surgical samples before chemotherapy, yet we would predict, based on the regulatory processes, that males and females were likely to respond differently something that we observe clinically. And then last but not least, that the changes in network structure can help identify both drivers of disease as well as potential therapeutic targets. So I hope you enjoy this presentation. I just wanna say this has been the work of a really um, wonderful group of people I've worked with over the years, including people who work with me here at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, um, former alumni, or I guess current alumni of our group who've gone on to other institutions, um, and really a talented group of faculty, staff, students, postdocs, 
who have supported this endeavor over time. So thank you for joining me at today's meeting. Um, and if you have any questions you don't get a chance to ask today, or for some reason things don't work out and we don't get a chance to connect, my email address is at the top, and I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thanks and enjoy the rest of the conference.